Hello there. In theory, I am live on the internet. I never really believe it when I see it and it says you're live on the internet, but I'm going to I'm going to have some faith that I am in fact live on the interwebs. Uh, in advance, I apologize. This is a half hour later than expected. We ran into a few technical difficulties, but we're able to muster through and find something that would work so that I can talk to sword friend Josh. Now, uh, I'm going to introduce and bring Josh in and let him introduce himself, but I'll give you a little note that I have been a longtime admirer of this man's work. He's very uh, awesome at making sword-related stuff, does some really cool stuff, and uh, one of the swords, maybe I'll, we'll talk about this later in the conversation, but one of the swords I deeply regret selling. One of the few things that I, I really wish I still had today was a sword that he uh, had a handle in, well, he had made the handle on. So um, anyway, I'm going to bring Josh in. It's Josh Marlin, Cottontail Customs. He does awesome sword work, and I'll bring him in and let him introduce himself. All right, let's see if I know how to do that. Josh, hey. you are live on the interwebs. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, sir, go ahead and introduce yourself to the to the people that have stuck around through our technical difficulties. <laughs> Sorry about that. That was not Matthew's fault. That's all my fault. My gear. I don't know what's with uh, the computer. I'm also really bad with tech stuff, but he figured it out. We figured it out. And I'm here. Josh Marlin, as he said, Cottontail Customs. I uh, work with uh, Swords and I've worked with them for, I don't know, close to 16 years, 17 years. I, I lost count. But uh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Matt. So your your time with Swordcraft is old enough to drive, but maybe not old enough to drink. Is that That's exactly it? Yeah, just on the cusp there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was Sword since uh, probably Dungeons and Dragons when I was 13, but um, you know, I didn't really get my first katana until uh, till much much later on, and then I didn't get into doing anything customizing uh, with it uh, for another few years. But yeah, it's been a long time. What what was your first katana, out of curiosity? A handmade swords katana. And it was a 1095 DH, uh, basic black and white, um, real classic. And it's funny because the reason I wound up with that in the first place is because I was on the SVG forum and they had uh, sponsors at the time. And I wasn't really familiar with forums or that kind of thing. So I didn't really know that that was uh, an advertisement. I thought it was, you know, uh, part of the SBG experience. I thought they were affiliated maybe. So I wound up clicking, checking out their swords. And, uh, you know, I found one that I liked. And that's why I bought it, basically. Do you still have it? I do not. I actually customized it twice and uh, wound up selling it. I think uh, Seth Griffin bought it from me. <laughs> okay. Had, uh, a nice little custom job on it. And it actually, you know, for the brand itself, uh, now that I know a lot more than I did then, um, not my first pick for that type of sword. The price wasn't terrible. I think it was just under 300 at the time. And uh, it, turned out to actually be a really excellent heat treat. It was a tough blade, maybe one of the strongest that I've had. We wound up using it at a, a carpentry shop I worked at, and I and all the other guys there were hacking away at everything that we could uh, use as a target and never bent, never chipped, never took a set. I mean, I was, I was pretty amazed that, uh, for what it was that it was that durable and lasted that long. So not that it's changed my mind on uh, their swords in general, but I guess I got really lucky. Do, do you regret not having your first sword? Like, is that? Uh, you know what? No, <laughs> because it was what it was. And I've changed my taste since then. Um, it was nice having it for as long as I did. And I'm really glad that I gave it some love before I uh, sold it. But um, no, no, don't don't really miss it now. <laughs> okay. I, I go through waves. I, I had this early on sword collection, as I'm sure a number of people who are, you know, pretty nerdy in the hobby do. And sometimes I miss having those like early, early things. Um, I took everything I had that wasn't functional um, or that wasn't, you know, like 
at least in my mind, good. And I, I just gave it to my younger brother. And he, he lived in a different state at the time. And I just took it all and put it in a big box and sent it to him and was like, I know you've you've wanted this for a while. Here you go. Um, awesome. But there's a few that I kind of I regret. I'm like, ah, they were garbage. But, ah, I got, you know, it's where I started. You know, you can never go <laughs> home. Sometimes I regret not having them. Yeah, I'm. You know, I'm not really sentimental that way. I guess uh, if it was a different sword, a, a sword that I still, you know, was into the style, and uh, I, I might miss it. But no, not really. I, I also, I think the second katana I bought was uh, one of the Musashi um, bamboo warrior. You know, for I think it was like sixty nine dollars at the time. Nice. Somewhere, I had gotten that, and I did a uh, quick custom wrap on it and i wound up giving that to my brother um but uh when i visited him the next time i saw that it was all bent up and and starting to run care for it so i took it back with the hopes of uh you know fixing it up and making it look a little better but sitting in my closet now for i don't know how many years so that's not really uh happening it didn't happen um yeah, so those were my two first katana that I can remember. I think I also may have had one of those uh, Hanwei, um, it looked like a, a big piece of bamboo. It was like yellowish. Yeah, and the bamboo, the bamboo you know, stick katana. Or something like that, yeah. Um, again, uh, that one, I think I, I probably gave that away. Uh, I don't remember what I did with that, but yeah, those are my first few and no no sentimental ties whatsoever nothing okay well i you know are there any swords that you have had that you regret selling or are all of them just kind of uh don't yeah. where you are the thing the thing is like i'm really glad that other people have them now and uh that they really liked them and appreciated them and it kind of made up for me um, not being able to pick it up once in a while, but I don't cut with swords and I don't practice. And, you know, they, they kind of just wind up sitting on a rack collecting dust or sitting in my closet. And, you know, I, I don't regret selling it. it. There's a few that I love especially. Um, and I really enjoy the experience of working with them, but to be honest, I'm really happy that somebody else has it and I hope they're using it and I hope they still have it and, and still like it. But uh, I really, uh, I have some swords on the rack behind me that I keep telling myself, well, one of them is going to be mine and I'm going to, you know, do it for myself. But it just never seems priority because probably, again, I, I don't use them. So... <laughs> It would just be there to look at once in a while. So I guess I really don't have ties to any sword at all. Oh, uh, when you have a uh, your desktop background on your computer, does it refresh every thirty seconds? Do you, are you one of those folks that has like a new picture all the time? Because like I I understand your mindset where if it's not a tool to you and it's art, you know, change change it up every now and again. That's that's fine, but yeah. Uh, I mean, again, I get the thrill out of doing the work on it in the first place. After that, it's really, you know, like the, like the one I was speaking about before, the first sword I had, um, I, I did work on it more than once, and I enjoyed both times. But, you know, uh, it's really, again, I it would just be sitting there, and I... <laughs> I would much rather ha know that somebody else is going to have it. Um, you know, I, I very well might wind up with no sword for myself ever. And am I going to be upset about that? As far as I can tell now, probably not. You know, so I like looking at the pictures of what I've done. I like going through my website and remembering those projects. And it inspires me to, you know, change some things for the next ones. It gives me ideas uh, for a, a new customization, um, stuff like that. But Really, I the only thing that I would never want to get rid of, it's not a sword, it's a suba that was made for me by my design, um, custom made, and shows the little rabbit, and it's kind of become my logo, and that's why part of the reason why I had it made. Uh, so that's 
probably the only piece I own that I'm never going to get rid of. Other than that, you know, anything that I have sword wise, fitting wise is subject to be sold at some point and, and not for the money again, for, again, knowing that somebody is going to like it, appreciate it, use it where I know I'm not. Um, sorry, but my phone, I, I wasn't planning on using my phone for this. And now I see that the battery is at 20%. So if I could just take a quick second to try to sure. uh, get this plugged in. I am going to uh, hide you for a moment. Okay. And uh, I will unmute you when you come back so that you can grab a charger and do as you will. So Sword Friend Josh, we've, we've had a, a hot minute of technical difficulties um <laughs> so in the uh in the interim i will hop over here and uh, i'll talk to sword friend josh about this sword in a minute this is one that i really really miss um and i yeah and so i'll, I'll talk about it in in a second but uh, to do a shameless plug for sword friend josh this is his website it's linked in the description cottontail customs and this is the cool stuff that sword friend josh does now uh i think it has been well it's been a hot minute since i've had anyone that could actually fix anything or do anything on the uh on the channel here but you've got his services i wonder if he's got does he have cool well this is probably all stuff he's done look at how cool this is look at how even the diamonds are god damn he just does such good work um so many so many pretty things over here and he works he, he turns trash into treasure this guy over here okay anyway he doesn't want me to say that anymore so i'm gonna i'm gonna go over here josh um before i uh before i talk anymore i, I am curious if you remember uh this sword right here does this ring a bell for you mm, it's so tiny on my screen right now oh wait uh so you would be responsible for this part right here Ah, that's a that's a KC, right? That is. So oh. that for for the layman's term, that's Chris Cutlery. Now I'm I'm taking a time travel, right? And everyone who sees, you know, I'm I'm sure like everyone that looks back at their first time in bed is not really like happy about their performance. Maybe that's <laughs> not the direction I should take with this conversation. But I I do know this is probably. <laughs> not anywhere near this last decade because i had this sword probably 10 years ago um so i know everyone improves and changes but josh this is one that i had that i bought secondhand you had worked on it and then i, I it was pretty early in my my sword day so probably 2013 i would guess wow would, would be the time frame that i had it and it was already you know old by then um and it was magic in the hand. I wish it's one of those swords I look back on and I really regret selling it. Somebody, you know, bought it from me and it was one of the finest feeling fun swords that I had. And I still think back on like, ah, oh, I shouldn't, uh, you know, people are probably going to kind of bat an eyelash because I've, I've had swords that are thousands and thousands of dollars. But I look back on this one that was hundreds of dollars. And I say that that was a that was a damn fine sword. And I really. I missed that. That was that was a good one. So I'm just curious, since this is on my like top three of shit that I made mistakes on, if you at all remember this one. Well, I, you know, I I can't say that I remember it, but I recognize it, and I I know that I worked on uh, more than a couple of the, that brand. Is that something I did for you specifically, or did you get it from somebody that? I, no, I I bought it from somebody else secondhand. It was a KC twenty nine two, uh, it's a Chris Cutlery twenty nine inch second version, and Josh did this handle, or at least that is the the information that I had. And since you can see that even even a decade ago, look at how nice and clean those diamonds are. They're a little smaller than the stuff you do now, uh, but even and nice and tight. And it was one of the first times that I had. Uh, like an inexpensive sword that had just really crisp, nice, comfortable. Like I felt connected to the blade right away. And it was, uh, it was so good. And I was such a dumb shit for selling it anyway. Um, cause no, it, was cheap. Like, <laughs> it was so cheap. I could, I see it and I know the work and I, I recognize a lot about it, but I, 
lost a lot of my early work in a, a couple of different computer crashes, unfortunately. So I don't even think I have a folder for that anymore. Um, and if I knew who it was that I did it for originally, I might remember a little more. But again, I, I definitely remember working with um, the Chris Cutlery Katana. And I remember working with that particular type of Ito that I really was into it. I, I loved the, um, the leather new buck, whatever it was. Um, yeah, the Namikawa new buck, I think, is what it was. Yeah, so uh, I know well, I did one for somebody that uh, was on the SBG forums. And um, I remember even posting it up there. And there might even still be... Uh, a reference to it somewhere there. I know that they have like archives, so it could be there somewhere. Um, it does look kind of familiar, yeah. And although I still think it it looks kind of nice, you know, this of course a lot of things about it that are <laughs> making my skin crawl a little bit, but uh, that's just because you know I, I've definitely grown a lot. I feel since then I, I've changed almost every single aspect of my methods and techniques, tools and materials. I, it's just like a completely different world from that piece to anything that I do now. Um, but yeah, I admit that uh, I still think it looks pretty good. Um, and sorry you sold it, but uh, yeah, those were fun swords. You know, that was my first brand that I really got behind. And that's why I did uh, work on so many of them. I just found that I felt it was a quality piece. I liked the fact that it was done in small batches and that they paid more attention to each piece of the furniture, which was made for each blade and each fitting was made for that blade. And they just, they put a lot of care into that, uh, into those swords and I, it showed. And when, when brands do that, uh, it makes it easier for me to make a nice looking piece in the end to to customize it when I first have to struggle with all the issues um, you know broken split wood rotted this and uh, things that were just done so incorrectly poorly that even my best efforts are not going to produce my best work you know so I found that with the old Chris Cutleries there was a lot about them that made what I was doing easier that made the final product come out better in my opinion, I also like the balance. I liked how tough they were. I liked how they cut, how they felt. You know, I was doing more cutting back then, and uh, they, I thought they were really great. And I think I worked for them, worked with them for a number of years. Well, I I can say that I've had um, probably a dozen Chris Cutlery swords in the KC twenty six and twenty nine. Those the twenty six inches, what that was. KC was the Chris Cutlery twenty six and twenty nine. Mm -hmm. were the the sizes and then they had uh the original and then the kc 292 there were there's some varieties some came with a bohi some did not their bohi tended to be uh not as as more or less if you can imagine the shinogi just ground out in like a slight hollow grind is kind of how they did bohi um it was wide and shallow yeah uh but they 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 all felt pretty good um the the way that you dolled that one up though was the only one that ever like i had that one that was the first chris cutlery sword that i owned actually i think the compilon was the first chris cutlery sword that i owned but the first katana was this one and i always thought like oh well i can just get another one like this Bullshit. uh the magic that you put in the handle was what separated it from like to me almost any other production katana one that felt maybe lighter or more okay those, those little nuances that allowed you to do your thing uh, were special to you, but really to, I would venture, I guess, nobody else. It, it didn't, anytime I had that other sword, anytime I had a Chris Cutlery KC-29, one, two, or three, they all kind of felt meh. But that one, that, that's why I sold it. I was like, I can always get another one of these. It's just a, a handle wrap. What a dumbass I was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's no denying there was something about that one. Uh, I, I, personally find that I bond with uh, leather wraps more than I do with silk or any other material. And that's to say that I find the leather more comfortable all the time than silk, but there's just something about, you know, gripping that and feeling like you're 
connecting with that particular sword with that handle i mean it's just something that i i really still like today so that's why i fell in love with that particular type of ito and i did so many projects with it because man once you touch that for the first time there's just it was hard to go back to anything else that's right there's there's another glimpse for for the folks joining now yeah, this is what i've been regaling about i i I did not just bring Josh on just to say, look at this sword I regret selling. You did it. That's that's. I know that's been like the first 30 minutes of this conversation, but um, that wasn't the only thing. Josh has also had a bunch of other swords. Uh, so you, you did mention that this lets you do your work well. I'm curious, what other brands out there do you think kind of nip and tuck things in a way that really lets you bring out some character like like this one did for me? Yeah, so um, before I, I go into that, I'll just uh, say that uh, I recently announced that I am not taking uh, commissions regularly anymore. Um, part of that is because I really, I, I let my queue go way too big and it feels like I've been doing that work uh, for way longer than I wanted to in the first place. So after three years um, and I finally uh, finished it. I wanted to really get some of my own stuff done. I had a lot of ideas. I wanted to be able to be creative. Not that, I mean, I really loved working for other people and, and building it to their design. I would never do anything that I was very against. So all my customers are so amazing and they were, we, we just jived. And, you know, so these projects were fun for me. I enjoyed them, but I also had my own stuff that I wanted to get done. So that's one reason. But another reason was a lot of the brands I was working with, again, they, they were difficult, which is not a problem. I, I could do the extra work, but in the end, I just felt like they weren't allowing me to give the customer my best. No matter how good I did on that piece, it just wasn't going to be as good as it could be if it was something better to start with. So that's another big reason why I, I stopped uh, for now. And when I do start up again, it's only going to be select brands that I know I could give my customers the best again. Um, so that would include uh, the Fei Long. I'll start with that because um, when I first reviewed it the first time, it was the Iwa Shobu. And uh, Dave um, had sent that over to me just to check out and do a review. As soon as I pulled it out of the Saya, as soon as I was, you know, really getting a close look at it, I said, wow, this is, this is a great sword. And then afterward, when I started customizing them, I found that uh, they did such a great job um, that it wasn't like I didn't have to do anything, but I didn't have to make all those repairs. I didn't have to completely change the shape. I didn't have to reconfigure everything just to be able to wrap it again. Um, you know, they did a lot of things right. And the materials they used were high quality. The quality of the construction was really great. So again, it took a lot of that extra stuff out of the equation. And it just let me focus on doing my work and it allowed me to do better work, I felt. So I've done, I don't know, dozens of them now, by now, and each one was basically just as enjoyable as the last one. So that's really consistent. And what I like is consistency. I like to be able to depend on these things. So I know if I wanted to do a nice custom, I don't have to think, oh, which brand am I going to, I could just go with the one that's been great every single time. So I would say that is at the top of the list for me being able to do the work that I do um, as, as good as I could do it. And another one, I guess, um, would be like the, the Zise, I guess. They, they oh, uh, even before that, the Kani, Kurin, uh, I don't know what the, the third name is, uh, the most recent, but, you know, that, that sword, that brand, um, they also really did a great job um putting that together so that uh somebody unwrapping it and rewrapping it didn't have to deal with a lot of the usual nonsense and mess um so that and zise and uh what else i uh huawei that seems to be one oh yeah uh, i'm forgetting a, a major one 
hallway to me was it was like finding the kc again it was like ooh, i love these swords everything about it just uh was great to me um i i have a taste where uh, i appreciate the basic the simple understated um and and that's what they were all about they didn't offer bling really unless you sent them your own fittings uh everything was kind of understated but again they did small batch work they paid a lot of attention to the carving to the material that they used i never found rotted wood under there i never found terrible cracks and splits um it seems like again the the furniture and the fittings were made or fitted for each blade i don't know if that's true but that's what it felt like working with them so I, I really found something again that I could, I felt like I could do my best work on. So that that's another one way, way up there. I've worked on dozens of those as well. Um, it just, again, it makes my life easy where I don't have to first start fixing everything from the ground up. I could just focus on what I'm there to do. And it's a pleasure, pleasure working with those. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, there's, there's a, um, a Shang sword up there. Uh, you know, he doesn't make them, obviously. And uh, I don't know where he sources them from, but they're not always all the same. They're not made by the same people every time. Dealing with him is a whole different story. <laughs> I'd rather not have to do that. So when I can find a piece secondhand, he has sold a lot of good quality swords, in my opinion. Um, generally, again, there's good fit and finish. There's a nice polish. There's a nice blade. The fittings are on there nicely. They use, you know, typically higher quality than than the usual. Uh, so that that's another one I'll throw in there. Not as something that I can rely on, but when I do see a piece that I think looks nice, chances are it's going to be something that I'm going to enjoy working with. I want to jump over to uh, some of the the fittings you've done. Um, in, in the back of my mind, is there a set like this where you had just an etched mushroom? Uh, everything that I've done. Like this, but with a mushroom in it and not mm -hmm. cut out. Not, not that I'm remembering. Uh, again, everything I've done as far as uh, fittings is on that page right there. I haven't done a lot, but I perhaps enjoy those as much or maybe even more making those than I do uh, wrapping handles because it's just something I have so much fun with uh, and it's something so contained. You know, I, I don't have to, there's not a lot of elements to it. Um, you could sit in one spot and use only a couple tools and they're very enjoyable for me. But no, I don't, I don't know that I did. I, I did etch obviously the background um, of that to, Two different things on one side you'll see the uh kind of normal shaped circles and the normal mushrooms uh on the other side it gets kind of wonky um so whether that's a hint at uh you know these mushrooms being psychedelic or not i just had a lot of fun with that it was just an idea that popped in my head and i i really enjoyed doing that one i may or may not have invested in a psychedelic mushroom katana myself but uh, oh. Yours in particular reminded me of this picture, which is probably not coming through super well. But oh, I see. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Th this is a picture from a website called Digital Blasphemy. And Digital Blasphemy, when I was a kid, was one of these websites that had desktop backgrounds. Uh, imagine a, a day where like Windows didn't come with good backgrounds and you had to go and like find pictures and digital yeah. art was rare and it wasn't AI generated. This was one of those photos that was like everywhere. It was a very like early viral kind of kind of picture. It, it does um, a little familiar. Um, I, either I've seen this or I've seen something very close to it. Yeah, but that that's uh, when I saw your your suba. Like it instantly brought me back to that like early digital like kind of a new way of art kind of thing, and it it uh, it was fun. So I that reminded me, but. You also made another one which caught my eye for one reason or another, which uh, is, I have no idea why I was drawn to this one. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
it's so Probably. strange that I would I would be like just kind of instinctually pulled to it in some way. But um <laughs> yeah, that was actually uh super fun also. Um this is I think the first time I actually did an insert into uh the steel. Um uh, that that copper design there is actually a separate disc that's uh inserted into the steel. So that was the first time I did something like that. And uh, that was a commission, um, I believe. And uh, that was really fun. I, I enjoyed that a lot. I, I like the the outline here. And for, for folks that might not know, I'm guessing this is the Habaki Seppa? Uh, yes, yes. When I do designs on the Seppa, um, it's always the, the Habaki one because, okay. as you know, no point in doing anything on the other one except for the edges because you can't see it. But th this is like just just a subtle little thing that nobody does. No, no, very every now and again you'll see an edge or something like that. But just this extra little uh, that's a, a euism right here. Um, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of stuff that's not traditional. Obviously, so I'm not always trying to stay within what has been done, what should be done. So I think I just said, you know, uh, I have this piece here that's going to be on uh, visible and it'd be really fun if I just put like a little design on there. Why not? And uh, so I've done that on the SEPA. I've done that on Habaki. Um, yeah, just totally out of fun. That, that was just fun to do. Well, it was fun. And for... 99% of you, that was not for me. Josh didn't make that for me. Not every other people like Mitsudomes. It's not just me who's zazzy over them. Um, so no, I I didn't I didn't commission that one, but I did notice and I did love it. So uh <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah, again, uh, I, I would I do a lot of stuff like that. Um, because you know, I'm thinking I'm not a samurai. Uh, I'm not Japanese. Uh, I'm not living in that culture, uh, although the culture means a heck of a lot to me. I am who I am. And if I'm going to have these pieces or make these pieces, you know, what's the harm? I think what's the harm in doing something that means something more to me? Uh, so that's that's kind of why some of my designs go off the grid as far as, you know, what's typically historical uh, and traditional. Um, why not? You know, people that own these swords now, there's no reason that they have to stick to, you know, strictly Japanese themes and, and culture. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking not Nehanto, but uh, when they have a production sword, it's their sword. And if they're going to feel more connected with a theme that means something to them, then I'm totally behind that. I, I understand that. And I love doing things like that for people when, when I'm asked, which is not often, and, and in my opinion, not often enough, because I would really like to see more people customize these things um, for them. And again, being able to go out of that uh, box, that Japanese culture box. It's I don't know a, how you feel about it, that. You know, admittedly, I, I think it would be more popular if it were more accessible. Um, there, there's a few inhibitors that I think come in there. One is price. Right. So as, as I think of the people that buy swords that I know. Right. So there's the people that I, I talk to from YouTube or collectors or things like that, that I that I know over text conversations or back and forth uh, direct messages. And there's there's folks I meet in person. And a large number of those are practitioners that I find at the dojo or that, you know, I meet in seminars and things like that. And price can absolutely be a factor. But so can time. Right. Just as you noted, you're not accepting commissions anymore and you are one of maybe a handful of people that do this kind of work where it is accessible and kind of uh I, I could explain what i want why it's meaningful and have confidence in your artistic interpretation both achieving that goal and producing a sword that is very useful to me as a practitioner and those are the, the people that can achieve that are, are very few and far between and Cost is one thing, but also like, you know, you're, you might have to wait three or four years to. <laughs> one guy, you know, it's like, um, you know, a lot of people offer to, uh, to work with me, uh, other companies, brands, people to collab and, and stuff like that. But, 
and even to to you know promote my name and get my name out there and get more business but it's it's always been like there's only so much i could do you know uh so i i love that people want to help me get my name out there and uh, share my work. But, you know, if a thousand people, if a thousand new customers call me up, I could still only take one or two, you know, that's so. Well, that that's a good topic to, to maybe talk about because I, I don't think a, a huge amount of people understand the time that it takes to do this kind of work. So uh, maybe you could elaborate, like if you were, firing on all cylinders, you didn't have a sick day, you felt great, and you were operating at the absolute maximum of your capability while still delivering the kind of work that you want to want to do, right? Not, not taking shortcuts, not, you know, not forced to make concessions, but you're delivering the kind of work you want to deliver to customers, but also you can 100% it every day. How many can you put out in a, in a month? say, or a year or whatever, whatever time frame you feel like. What, what are we doing about in the handle or doing like a uh, more elaborate? Uh, well, maybe, let's maybe say like how many handle wraps could you do in that time versus how many full projects? I send you a bare blade with a hibaki. You do everything else. Okay. So, um, you know, of course, uh, the level I'm working at now is different than what I used to. So in the past, I was one younger and had less pain everywhere but um i didn't really uh it didn't take as long because i wasn't doing the same thing that i'm doing now I wasn't using the same techniques uh it takes me a lot longer now even if i didn't have um you know pain in my fingers after wrapping for hours um just the technique part of it alone the method that i use takes a lot longer so i would say i can get a average size um piece done without, again, anything too elaborate, without lacquer that, that takes a long time to dry, just straightforward, put new um, ray skin on, wrap it up. I would say I could, if I pushed myself, I could probably do that in four days. Um, but that would be really pushing it and I would be in pain because uh, now I do about an hour and a half, and I'm already feeling it in my in my hands, my knuckles, my tendons. Um, after two and a half hours, three hours, I'm like, I could barely feel my fingers anymore. And when I can't do that, I can't do things as precise as I need to. So I have to stop. Um, sometimes it takes me the rest of the night until the next day to be able to pick it up again. Um, sometimes I could get away with you know, waiting. If I start in the morning, I might be able to pick up a little bit again at night. Um, but yeah, it takes a while. And then a handle that's a little more elaborate with lacquer work that has to dry and other elements. It could take me over a week to do one. One handle. And so that's, uh, that's, is that including making the core or is that? No. Wrapping. No. I wasn't even, no, that's that's including all the prep work I have to do to an existing core where I have to maybe do some reshaping or uh, do a little bit of fixing, something like that, adjust the length, things like that. But if I'm making a new core, a new core now could take me several days. Uh, it could probably take another week for me to really nail down if it's, especially if it's a full wrap, something like that, or if it has uh, unusual fittings. Um, but, you know, on a, on a good week uh, when I'm feeling great and everything goes smoothly, I could probably get a basic core done in four days. So I, I think that's a, a useful thing to note for folks, right? Because you, you go online and you see somebody wrapping a handle, right? And you see them in a production line and you see this, you know, kind of auntie with a, with a handle and they're tying it up and they're moving through it and it looks like it takes 15 minutes. And here's Josh over here saying, if you want the wood shaped correctly, it's gonna take me four days. And if you want the handle done right and you don't want me to kill myself, I'm gonna take a week to make you a handle, right? And at the end of that, I'm gonna have one handle, not a pile of them, one, one handle. Um, and so when you're looking at the economies of scale and why things cost what they do, well, it's, it's, you know, it's, it becomes less surprising. 
the, the difference is though, and and granted, Josh, I've not held a number of your swords. I've I've had that one comes to mind. Obviously, I won't go back to it because we talked about it for a half an hour. But I, I want to say I've had another couple come through my hands o- over the years. Um, but each one of them has had a, you know, an enhancement to the sword that was at, absolutely added to it. Right, like it, it's. Uh, it, it adds a sense of connection and feeling and dynamic to the sword that doesn't come through on paper. Like if I measure things and say like, hey, here's the the weapon dynamics computer and here's how you should feel the sword. It doesn't, I, I can't put on paper why it feels good when the Ito's tight, right? Yeah, you like have I, to. I, I can tell you like it doesn't feel like it's going to run out of your hand. You don't feel like you have to white knuckle it. Th- those are things that... Um, I, you know, being in the business of words, uh, I'm surprisingly bad at it, but there, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that as a reviewer, I, I really struggle with because it's, it's a sense of magic that absolutely should be able to be conveyed to people. But I, I, I really, really struggle with because yeah. it doesn't come through on paper. There's no way to prove it. And if I zoom in on the camera and push on it, it does, you know, my finger turning white doesn't seem to really convey the sense of majesty that a good wrapped handle does. And you might wind up feeling like it's a cop out when you say uh, over and over and over, you just have to feel it. You just have to hold it to hold it to know. But that's the truth. I mean, what you're saying is absolutely true. Um, even the change in thickness, the shaping, you know, from the typical bulky, bulgy, rounded um, to the more oval, streamlined, slim feel, it's a completely different feel on the same exact sword. And it makes the whole sword feel different. So you're right. Yeah, it is hard to to convey that. It's it's hard to convey when you're probably predominantly talking to people that haven't held one versus the other, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I I feel like I'm I'm often that forty year old virgin. Like it's it's a it's a it feels like a bag of sand, you know. Like it it rem- <laughs> 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 it's that quote. Like I I don't know how to. <laughs> How to describe it, you know, like you can hear people describe something a thousand times, but it doesn't register until you've uh, held it yourself. Yeah. I'm going to move away from that before I go into the gutter fully. Um, I did want to ask then who you, you've mentioned some sword companies that you think uh, do a really good job that you like to work with. But I'm sure you've held a number of others out there recently. Me and a, and a few other folks have have talked about tier lists online and like who does a good job and many of the ones that you've mentioned kind of float to the top though admittedly Fei Long did not did not make it as high up on the list uh probably very likely due to my uh unfamiliarity with them having had one example only in comparison really, yeah. to the number. you know there's there's so few out there yeah but who do you who do you not like working with who's I, I don't I'm not trying to stir up drama drama but who's uh when when somebody says hey will you put a new handle on this one and you're like no i'd rather rather slam my dick in a sliding glass door than touch one of those fucking things you know you see i've probably uh said that so many times things like that online but never uh live on uh youtube so <laughs> it's gonna be a different experience even though this is something <laughs> i've been doing for years and years and years and you know, if people are going to send me a, a bomb in the mail or I just have to take my chances because, you know, this is I feel strongly about these things. And, you know, I have nothing really against uh, a lot of these companies that I won't work with. It's more I, I've always felt like that I needed to stand behind the customers like like I wanted to be the voice that helps them get something they're happy with or help them avoid something I think they're not going to be happy with. It's not, uh, you know, people think that I'm, I am I bash every brand that I don't work with and I know it comes off that way, but it's really coming from a place where I, you know, because I've had to deal so many times with telling a customer that the sword they just spent a fortune on that they sent me to work with, I, I can't really do much for them. You know, it's beyond repair. It's uh, even if I can fix it, it's not going to look as good as it should. Um, and and they're so disappointed when I give them that news. And they didn't know because they didn't take it apart. They don't know what's underneath at all. 
Um, on the surface, it looks like every other store, but when you really get down under the hood, you know, there's things that I just, I have to break the bad news and, and they feel awful. And sometimes they could return it and get their money back, but most of the time they can't. So they learned a hard lesson. And I was the one that had to help them learn that lesson. And so I feel like the more I talk about it, the more I try to recommend, the more I try to point out what's not great about certain brands, you know, I, I feel like it's going to help not only the people buying the swords, but the more people demand from the, the brands they buy from, the more they change things. Most of them, you know, they, I feel that most of the brands now that deliver, that, that make and deliver poor quality, they're only doing that because they don't know that somebody wants something different. You know, that's what they think that people want. That's what they sell them. And if people don't know these these problems, they, they don't complain and they don't ask for anything the next time they buy one. But as people learn and ask these sellers to change this, change that, could you add Ishigami? Could you, you know, uh, make sure that the end knots are on the right size and all that? Most of the time they will. And um, I saw that with Huawei starting out that they weren't producing the, the best uh, furniture and, and fit and finish in the beginning. They had a nice blade, but the rest of the stuff was lacking. And the more we were asking for it, the more they accommodated us. So I feel like being that voice is not only helping the person that's purchasing, but it's helping the industry in general. Um, I'm not taking credit for all of that. I'm just, this is what drives me to keep telling, uh, you know, saying these things. And, and again, it comes off as bashing, but it's really not. Um, I just see what I see. I say it when I see it. If people want to take that uh, to heart and and hate me for it, you know, I can't change that. But if I somebody go to die from cancer of the ass a few times a day, so don't don't get me wrong. I I, I understand that saying saying what you see, uh, trying trying to be honest and transparent sometimes does not make you friends. But in that, like. Uh, at least in the background, if I'm understanding correctly, Josh, and I, I don't mean to speak for you, are you saying that you, you hope that these companies improve yes. and make compelling and good products and that you, you wish them success, but success Absolutely. from making a product that is worthy of customers? Absolutely. And it really has very little to do with me because I don't buy swords for myself. I'm not one of the people that is, uh, you know, getting disappointed like that. I'm the one that, uh, you know disappoints other people by telling them these things. Um, so it's not, it's not for me. I'm not doing it for me. You know, uh, again, I'm not, I'm not the one buying them. I'm doing it because I hate seeing people get disappointed. I hate seeing people remove the uh, ska to find terrible things under there and then realize they can't use that sword that they just bought. And, you know, uh, if, if a Suba is on backwards, if, if something is just not done right, the Manuki are upside down and backwards, uh, the end knots are on, all that stuff. If, if those were to improve uh, from the sellers, I'd be thrilled. You know, again, I'm not buying it, but I so know people who's buy Who's on your shit list? Who's, who's on your uh, do not touch list? All right. So if we're going to go back uh, in the past, um, the first time I really experienced issues like that was with Ronin Katana. I know that I've had beef with the owner. Um, it was all out there uh, in public on SBG. There was some really heated battles going on there. Um, but that all stemmed from, you know, not being able to work well with them because I felt that the quality was just severely lacking. Um, it got to the point where I stopped taking any commissions with Ronan Katana years ago. Uh, and this includes their elite models. This includes like their top end. Um, I just feel that the materials were, were poor quality, the construction, the shaping, the fit and finish. I mean, there were so many things, uh, including even if I were to make a new handle for it, the blade, the Nakago was, was so out of whack that it made all of that impossible for me uh, eventually. And again, I had a, a person that I remember distinctly who was a lawyer who bought a uh, very expensive elite model, sent it to me. I had to tell him, uh, I'm so sorry. I, I just can't work with this. There's, 
I can't even make a new handle. Everything is so poorly done on this. The the Mikugi Ana was way off where it should have been. I mean, it was a nightmare. And he was very upset, not with me, but very upset that uh, he felt like he got swindled. So he contacted them. They said, you know, you've already had this guy take it apart. We don't, we don't offer refunds for that. Being a lawyer, I guess he used the right words, uh, threatened or whatever he did. And they wound up finally refunding him. Um, so that was one of the, the, incidents that I remember clearly, but yeah, that, that was a brand that I had immense difficulty working with just because I felt it was such poor quality. I mean, whether this, I, I even did a review where it was a positive review overall, because the sword, as you get it from the factory, if you're going to cut with it, and if you're going to cut the appropriate targets, it's really not terrible. I mean, I, I felt it was a little clunky and, and overbuilt and a little dead feeling in my hands, but you know, it cut. And if that's what people were buying it for, it was fine. You know, um, it was because I worked with them that I grew to dislike them so much. Uh, so that that's one brand that I had a big problem with. Uh, I, you know, the, for the other brands, I, I don't know that I can point out any particular one because I feel these drop down menu brands are all the same and they really are because once you find out you know where the blades come from where the parts come from the handles the fittings all these they're basically all getting the same stuff and they they get all these individual pieces and parts and they assemble it they uh try to find the closest to someone's custom order as far as blade length and style and then the color of ito and they kind of throw it all together and so I can't really pick on anyone in particular because Ryan Sword and Jaku and Hanbon, it's all kind of the same to me. Um, I, I do see some issues on more brands than others, more of the time than others. Uh, like <laughs> I know people are listening to me now that, that absolutely disagree and, and love this brand, but Hanbon Forge, I keep seeing that the handles are, are just, there's always an issue. And most of the time, um, you know, it's not just about how it looks. It's about uh, the Ito being overwrapped onto the Kishira and, and with use, especially on a rounded end, it's gonna slip off. And once it slips off, you know, the Ito becomes unraveled. And, uh, you know, people, a couple, couple people said, oh, I'll just retie it. But, you know, I always give the analogy, try to tie your sneakers and clip off that knot and then try to retie it. You know, because when you're tying the end of a handle, you have at least half a foot to a foot of extra length of Ito to be able to do those knots and feed it through and do everything you need to do. Once you clip and you're finished with that final knot, if you were to untie it and then try to redo that knot, it's going to be near impossible to get that done. So that's one thing I see on almost every one of their handles is the Ito is overlapping. And then I, I see, you know, they don't inlay the, uh, the Samagawa into the core. So I know over time what happens is that adhesive they use, that wears out and with heat and use, it'll start shifting and slipping. And as the Ito gets looser, it's just going to become a mess, and then the handle needs to be redone or becomes unsafe. Um, I feel they're, they're, they're boxy. You know, there's a lot of other issues, but the main ones are the ones that I know are going to make those handles unusable for people that actually use them. For someone just using them for display, you know, if they like it, that's really all that matters. But uh, as far as function, I feel they fall short. But I've seen plenty of Ryan Sword like that. I've seen plenty of Jaku like that. Um, you know, you name the, the drop down menu place and I've seen the same thing. Uh, they don't use Hishigami most of the time, even when they do offer it, it's usually something like cardstock or, you know, a flimsy little piece of paper just to say they've used it. It might help a little bit for, for a little bit of time, but that paired with, again, the poor quality Ito that's going to stretch the loose Maki job that's going to come, you know, it's going to get looser. So the Hishigami really don't mean anything after that happens. Uh, so yeah, I would put them all into the same category as far as 
me being unable to really work with them. Uh, and, and a lot of the time, the wood that they use is just terrible quality. I mean, it's the grain isn't running in the right direction. It's rotted. You, know, you could smell it when you take it off. It's got an awful smell. They have sugar deposits in it. They have knots that weaken the overall structure. Um, it's just not carved well. It's not fitted well because they're jammed onto Nicago that wasn't meant for it. You know, all those issues are, it could be found in all of those companies, I feel. So I don't take work on any of those um, anymore. And I, I, I feel like it's, you know, just, just to play maybe devil's advocate here. I don't know if it's devil's advocate. Um, you're making a, a custom bespoke product, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you have this um, made to be a modular construction piece, because it seems like a lot of the, the drop down menu vendors, as you described them, you know, they, they buy a blade from one of the, the many manufacturers that are out and about in Long Chuan, and then they, they get handles from another supplier that are made to fit what seems like almost a, a standard template. Like everyone works from the 10 millimeter nut. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's not quite as precise as like a, a standard, you know, uh, size, but kind of close. They're all working from what seems like a, a similar template. And then they tap the fittings together with a rubber mallet, right? And they, everyone buys from the same vendor. You know, they have like a, a Lowe's, but instead of hardware, they sell Fuchikashra and Tsuba and Manuki and such. And they, they go buy them and get a, get a ska with those things and tap them together. And sometimes the handle breaks apart because it's that 10 millimeter nut was actually a 12, you know, <laughs> and that's just not going to fit. So they, they pound them together and it makes a crack and it makes a problem. Um, at the same time, you mentioned earlier Ronin Katana, which is a brand that I've usually usually given more than favorable reviews to. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, in the background, like I think of them as a person that's targeting background cutters, right? Or, or backyard cutters, somebody who wants to go and whack stuff at a dojo. You buy your first sword and you're going to, you know you're going to slap it to Tommy Matt pretty hard. In, incidentally, when you cut to Tommy, my hand is coming through. They almost advise you to cut the sword like this. Like you're bringing it down straight and sideways. They almost mm -hmm. encourage you, or at least the, one of the schools that I study in, almost encourages you to just slap a to Tommy Matt with the side of your sword. And if it's a differentially hardened blade, it's, it's pretty easy to bend those things. And Ronan Katana, you know, Love them or hate them, for better or worse, have held up really well to some of those more abusive things, cutting branches, yeah. slapping to Tommy. Um, the Ito, I, I, can, I can say sometimes it's been on the loose side, but for a person that's just starting in a dojo, for a person that wants to go cut branches in their backyard, they seem like a, a really solid option. And, and that seems a bit more where they push their audience or at least who they're trying to make product for. When I think of who's sending swords to Josh, and if I understand correctly, like it, it's it's over a thousand dollars to send you a sword and have you make it good. Like if you're doing the whole thing, not just the handle, but if you're making a saya and you're making a, a handle and you, you have a, a bear blade and habaki and you're gonna you're gonna make a sword, it, it's not, you know it's more than the cost of the sword itself, which I think Ronins are like three or four hundred bucks. Yeah. It's well. More Really, I mean, uh, um, that, uh, you know, if uh, when I have sold swords for over a thousand, it was because it, I was selling the whole sword. I wasn't doing the work for them. I was first paying about 300 to $600 for the sword itself. And then by the time I'm done with all the stuff that I do, then it becomes over a thousand. When, if I've done any custom work on somebody else's sword and it came to more than a thousand, then they really went all out and had me do fittings and sia lacquer and every bell and whistle that, that they could possibly do. Usually it's not even close to that. I would say high average for nice handle work with a full wrap and best materials and highest grade Samigawa probably is about half of that. Okay. So 500 bucks, but still the, the sword itself is 300 bucks, right? Yeah. So 
if you're if you're having just the handle made, not saying it's not worth it. I I certainly don't mean to even vaguely insinuate that because hopefully the first half an hour where I said this sword that was two hundred dollars was made magic by a sword by your hand, right? That handle is what made it special and makes me a guy who's handled twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollar swords think back on this four hundred dollar sword and say I miss it. Like that handle is, is special. So I I don't mean to say it's not valuable. Still. I don't think of a, a genuinely a person that's buying a three hundred or four hundred dollar sword, then spending another five hundred dollars to have the handle wrap like those. I know those seem a little probably not like the common market. Maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But it, it seems like their their customer is primarily a person who wants to have three hundred bucks and go whack branches in their backyard and have a sword that survives it. Yeah, but Do that's you, that for someone wanting to send me a Ronin now. Uh, for what I would charge now. But back in the day when I was still willing to work on Ronin, you know, I was probably close to the 200 mark just to wrap the handle. So buying sort for 300 and spending 200 to make it really feel great for them and personalize it, you know, that's that's less, um, that, that's easier to, to comprehend and to deal with as far as, you know, financially. But um, yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and, I, uh, that's why my review for them was positive because it wasn't about, you know, how I felt working with them. It was about how it is out of the box using it. And they are tough, you know, but then again, they are thicker blades than most other blades. They are kind of overbuilt, as I stated before. Um, and if you're talking about the through harden, you know, those can obviously take more abuse uh, as far as bending, taking sets than a, a DH version. But um, yeah, you're right. I, they they are good for that kind of stuff, for whacking stuff in the backyard and for, you know, some light dojo work, unless your school is more strict about balance and weight and, you know, those kind of details. Um, I felt that the Ito they use is a different kind of synthetic silk than the standard that you find on most of the others. It's very slippery. So I didn't, and it kind of like burned my skin. It, it gave me blisters uh, after using it for not too long. So I didn't really love that part about it, but yeah, you know, for a, a backyard whacker, <laughs> what, it's not a lot to complain about. Have you uh, gotten a chance to play with any cloud hammer stuff? As we yeah, talk about black hard, whack, back, black hard whackers, that's what I'm saying. Backyard whackers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did a review. Uh, I have one, uh, the one on the top of the rack there in the bag. That's a, a cloud hammer. Um, I forget all the details about it now, but I think it had a leather wrap. And uh, I think it was a DH blade. Um, generally, I, I thought it was pretty nice. Um Overall, for the price, I thought it was a fair price for what you were getting. It felt like a solid sword. Um, what I like most about Cloud Hammer is are the people that are are running it, um, and the fact that they're, you know, there and they're present and they're involved with uh, um, all the groups and the forums and stuff like that. I think they care much more than your typical um, direct from China sellers um they have more knowledge uh they they i believe they collect nihanto so they they really know what the swords are supposed to be uh replicating um the quality again i, I thought it was really fair I, I wouldn't say it's the nicest swords that i've ever reviewed or handled but certainly i would not lump them into those other categories uh, i think they're for somebody that doesn't want something, let's say, as fancy and as themed out as a Dragon King, um, but they don't want something as bare bones as a Ronin or something as, you know, poorly put together as, uh, you know, a drop down menu sort, I think they offer something different. And they offer it for a price that most people feel like they want to spend for something like that. Well, RVA Katana, the. Uh... John John at RV Katana, I think is who's behind that, this account is here. Not and he's uh he's he's in the chat room here. So um it looks like him and Scott are going back and forth. Yeah, so, yeah. I respect what they do and how they bed, do it. Bedroom whacker. There we go. <laughs> 
They're they're having fun in chat over here. <laughs> uh, I don't know where they are, but uh, yeah, no, I you know I I've talked to uh, John and uh, he you know he was the one who arranged to send me the the sword that I reviewed, and uh, I, I really uh, I respect their whole operation there. Um, they're not the kind I feel that would just be off in the money, just sell you something once and uh, ghost you if something goes wrong. You know, it seems like they're in it to to grow and uh, they're receptive to criticism and suggestions. I feel like if I were going to work with any other brand other than uh, Fei Long, uh, not that I'm planning to, but I feel like it would be a good relationship and we'd be able to get stuff done and I'd feel good about it. So well, John, that I'm going to jump in and just tell John, give this man some, you know, get, get on your books. Like I can imagine a, uh, a Josh Marlin cottontail custom special tier of S five Katana that wax rocks and breaks them and somehow also feels magic in the hand because of your handiwork. That, that seems like something that would, uh, <laughs> That would be an extra special kind of fun. I want to point out that uh, it's funny you say that. Uh, I don't know if you were talking to him about that previously or it's just coincidence, but he actually did reach out um, kind of right before I went on tonight and uh, proposed something like that. And I, I was really uh, honored yes. that did that. I, yes. I, <laughs> no, I didn't talk to him about it, but yes. Well, well, before you Where's get the machine gun of likes? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, before you get too excited, I had to you know, let him know that I, I'm not really open to that as of right this minute, you know, to be honest, I, again, I just finished uh, coming out of three years of doing commissions and I haven't even been able to get uh, past the start of a new core for the first custom that I wanted to do uh, because I'm dealing with some other injuries and, and whatnot. But um in the future, could it happen? Uh, possibly. You know, I'm also fiercely, fiercely loyal to my amazing partner, who you know, Dave uh, from Phelan. Uh, I would never do anything with anyone else unless it was okay with Dave. Uh, my loyalty is always going to be to Dave first. It's been a amazing relationship and partnership for all the years that we've been working together. Uh, he's a, a, a great guy and i have never been happier working with anyone for this long i mean honestly um even uh bosses from other jobs i've had i mean he's just a great guy makes it super easy and i you know i'm staying loyal to him for now as far as um working with a stock sword and we even talked about me um giving him some ideas about a quote unquote signature piece for cottontail customs through Phelong. Uh, so, you know, I, I would be open uh, to the thought just because I think, again, John is uh, a really uh, cool guy and I, I like RBA and what they stand for. And, you know, I, I can't say I, I don't know. It's possible. But I was very honored that he, he asked me. Um, I, I've always wanted to do something like that, uh, but I never had the guts or patience to deal with uh, Chinese forges directly. Um, so I kind of am doing that through Dave, who takes all the crap work, the brunt work of, of dealing with them and keeping on top of them and, and all that stuff. So, you know, yeah. So again, who knows? It's, it's it sounds like a, you know, if, if the project comes to bear, it sounds like a really fun thing because uh, most of my critiques have, uh, around the Cloud Hammer, as I think of Cloud Hammer primarily, I think of like the S5, S7 as the the thing that's a real differentiator, right? Um, I gave Ronan a lot of praise earlier for being really, really durable on a budget. And for $100 more, you could get something that was, had a little bit of leather and like was a little more, you know, a lot of the com complaints that I had about Ronan were addressed for what seemed like a, a marginal amount of money. Mm. And at the same time also was, you know, a cut above when it came to how many licks does it take to to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop when you're doing outrageous, stupid things like I do with a sword, right? Yeah. Um, and so if you wanted that like ultimate durability 
and also wanted you know some of these these other things nipped and tucked that's that's good but the, that nipped and tucked is not at the same level that you provide right so when i think of like that really really high end you want to feel an amazing sword you're you're in that running for who can produce those kind of results and to have a sword that could you know stand the test of uh of abuse while simultaneously having the you know the feeling that you you inspire in it would be would be really really special like you know if you made your own fittings and you did your own thing and it kind of had your mark on it and, and felt the way that you could make them well yeah. having that performance in the background would just would just be so fun that would be so cool yeah I, I agree and you know if i were to partner with somebody it would basically be i would be focusing on one thing while they're focusing on possibly other things i I focus obviously primarily on aesthetics and uh, especially the uh, handle and the way that everything fits together, fit and finish, stuff like that. I couldn't really tell you that I'm an expert in steel type. S7, S5, to T10, to this, to that, to CMP, B3, whatever. You know, I, I, I equate it to the interior almost of a, of a car. I, it, it's not a direct... You know, you, you say aesthetics, but I think that almost undermines what you do a little bit, right? Like, well, if just, you're if you're I'm, if you're trying to drive us drive a car with a vice grip, right? You, you, it doesn't matter like how fast you can go, or it you know it it's gonna feel like shit. You're not gonna you're not gonna be very quick. It's not gonna give you the experience you you want. But if that if that is tailored to make you feel connected to the wheels, like you're you're gonna move around, and even something that might underperform in other ways will overperform given your your comfort and ability to act on on the the signals that you're getting um and so th there's there's a practicality to it that it goes beyond the aesthetics but that like nipped and tucked is a is a is a underrated thing that again being you know seeing as well, how i feel like it's almost my job to explain it i feel like i'm doing a shitty job doing it but it's real I, important get you completely and you're absolutely right and um because I do focus on obviously more than just how it looks. I, I base even the shaping I'm doing and the length of the uh, core and, and, and that kind of stuff, I'm basing it on things that I've learned about Nihanto and, and how they're supposed to be done and form follows this and this follows that. And so I, I really try to uh, understand that as best I can so that I can add to the sword more than just looks. I mean, I could do a pretty wrap, but if I don't do all those other things correctly, it's just not going to feel right. It's not going to cut right. Someone's not going to enjoy using it. But when it comes down to the actual composition of the steel, and what is tougher and what's better for that kind of thing for different kind of targets, I really don't focus too strongly on that. Um, and there's there's other aspects. I'm not a practitioner, so I can't say that I really know how something is supposed to feel or how it's supposed to be balanced. I'm, I'm getting that knowledge from people that know, and then I add my bit to it. And it's, yes, it's more than a bit. I, I do focus again on more than just looks. So, but uh, that's where a partnership would really work well with me because people that know about those other things that I just don't either know about or don't focus on, they would take care of that end. I would take care of this end. And between the both of us, I feel we'd be able to produce a really great sort overall. Yeah. Then it could come to this end, and I would say not shitty things about it. Um. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> you definitely have more experience as far as using the swords and certainly abusing the swords than I do. Um, I couldn't tell you what really takes to to push something to uh its absolute limits because i've never done that myself i've seen you do it and whatever i do know is by learning from you and that's exactly again what i do with others i learn from people that are practitioners i learn from people that actually forge the blades themselves uh i don't have that experience myself but i learn from them you know, you, you mentioned uh, an interesting topic, and I think this is where now, sorry, uh, jumble of thoughts here. Josh and I, for the folks that are, are tuning in here, have corresponded over Sword Buyer's Guide, Messenger, Facebook, or, or like forum posts, probably dozens of times over the last decade or so. But this is the first time we're talking to each other face to face. Um, so 
talked on the phone too. Yeah, we we we've spoken on the phone, but this is, I I didn't know what you looked like until you popped on camera today. So, uh, uh, we've disagreed over over the years on something, and one of those things has been breaking swords and and pushing things to failure. And I am curious, given that obviously I'm I've invested a fair amount of time in smashing swords. Uh, it, it seems like earlier on, a decade ago you were not for breaking swords and thought that they were, that that was a, a useless activity. And it, it seems like now you may have changed your mind a little bit. And I'm curious, wh what value do you find in doing that, if any? Well, first of all, nobody does it better than you. Thank you. Um, it's the honest, right. as far as my exposure to it, not that I seek out destruction videos, but, um, uh, you know, you do it really, really, really well. You know what you're doing. You do it safely as, as safely as you can. Uh, I respect that. Um, I respect that you have the balls to, to destroy something, even when it's beautiful <laughs> and expensive. Uh, so I don't like it. I don't like it, Josh. I don't want to tell you that I like it. Well, you seem to enjoy it <laughs> a little bit, but like, you know, I, I, I would rather keep it. <laughs> Well, not not enjoying the fact that you've destroyed something, but enjoying what you're doing when you're doing it. Um, but anyway, I the the way I looked at it before, and and probably the way I still look at it in the larger sense is that if I'm going to buy a sword, and even if I'm going to cut hard targets with it, I never picture myself wanting to destroy it completely. So. As far as what I was thinking then was, why would I need to know about how a sword, uh, how much it could take before it's destroyed if I'm never, ever, ever going to attempt that myself? I'm never going to want to do that. Um, for me, uh, it felt like I wanted to know much more about how the sword performs for what I would be doing. And yes, maybe pushing it a little beyond that because I may not have access to some of the, the materials to cut like multiple mats and, and hard bamboo. So I wouldn't really be able to do that myself, even if I was tempted to do that with my sword. But that's, I felt like it was much more important for me to know how the sword, sword performs under the conditions that I would be using it for. Um, so destroying it, you know, anything could be destroyed if you apply enough uh, abuse and pressure to it. But I would never do that, so I was never that curious. I know, though, that that's a really big thing in this kind of industry, even uh, knives and other products that aren't even bladed. People, for some reason, always want to know that they're buying the toughest, strongest, most indestructible thing they could possibly do uh, buy, uh, especially when you're talking about these custom knives that go for thousands of dollars, and I personally know people that have had these knives and I personally know that they've never cut anything more than tape and string with those knives, maybe a tomato. So why do they have the, why do they feel like they have to have something that could cut a mountain in half and survive? Like I never understood that, but I see that that's a thing that's important to a lot of people. I don't know that I'll ever, you know, cut this thing with it, but I want to know that my sword that I buy can handle it if I decided to. I want to know that it could be driven over by an 18 wheeler and not have a dent or a scratch. You know, so in that sense, I thought what you were doing was good for those people, you know, because they were curious and they want to know and they're sometimes basing what they're buying off of that information. For me, it just never was important because again, I could never imagine myself doing that with any of my swords. If I was going to buy a sword, especially an expensive one that was geared for cutting uh, specific targets in a specific way, I would make sure that I'm doing everything I can to use it as it was intended because I don't want to destroy it and I want it to function the best it can. So even someone like me that has no alignment or form or, or training or any knowledge really about using the sword, I mean, uh, I would want to make sure that I'm, I'm cutting targets in the way that the best way that I can to have it perform the way it was designed to perform. So that's how I feel about that. I mean, it is interesting to see what it takes, but I don't really feel that it's giving me any useful, relevant information 
for myself to to base you know to form my decisions on so that that's that's how i felt and and kind of still feel about that now i uh i will admit that when i started doing this started the the breaking thing it was a bit of a novelty and i I broke it because it was fun and I wanted to learn what it would take. People found it interesting and seemed to find value in it beyond just the things that I did. Uh, and I felt really weird about getting samples that had value and keeping them, right? And and coming away from this review process with something that could make me biased. I've, I've gotten over, you know, a few of those things and I, I feel like breaking things offers me, me personally a little bit less. Not that there isn't still things to learn, but... I feel like I have a pretty good idea about when a sword is going to break and how to do it and how to do it efficiently. Um, but in terms of the value, I've, I've learned a little bit different. And th this is a photo I'm going to share. I don't think I've ever shared it from 10 years ago at a at a event for martial arts. And this is, uh, I'm zooming in on the wrong thing. Um, so this is uh, a gentleman that we will call Sword Friend Jay. Um, holding a sword that appears not to be there. <laughs> that is a steel Eito. It's not zinc aluminum, to the best of my knowledge, mm -hmm. that broke at the hilt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a sword that was probably less than a decade old that had been used by experienced practitioners that only used it for drawing and sheathing an EI. And the, the, the power that they draw and stop Created mm. enough friction to break that steel sword at the hilt. Yep. Um, so when 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 I think of like, hey, wh what's the value in breaking something? I, I it's not scientific, but I get the impression that if I can break it doing, obviously breaking it on like a steel stake is different. But in the tests that I do that bring it up to that point, if it can take branches and beating on brass things and being tossed at a tree, those are in my mind, in, in some small way, like an accelerant to that event, right? 10 years of using this sword for just drawing and sheathing eventually caused it to snap at the hilt. And if it has that kind of weakness in it, it's going to be accelerated by the nonsense that I do. And and that's proven to be the, the case in a few examples that, that have come to bear. There's been a few times where I've tested something and I've, I've slapped it against the, the side of the blade and it's broken. Instead of bent or twisted, the blade is just snapped. Instead of uh, when I when I cut into a barrel or a brass fitting, uh, the sword broke at the hilt and and swung back at me. And that could be the exact case that happened to this gentleman in the photo, right? Wherein uh, he's he's just doing. I was there watching him at this event. All he was doing was ei, and the sword snapped in half, and he turned around and made that face, <laughs> saying like. Uh, and he 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 had borrowed the sword, incidentally, as well. He was he was a guest. He's a very senior practitioner, and he had borrowed the sword to to you know bow in and do the the startup kata of uh, the the ei that's done for this style. And when he he stopped, you know, he's he's a senior person in front of you know fifty people that are are watching him, and he's he's trying to probably do do it right, and it just broke the sword right at the hilt, and he turned around and was like, "I'm sorry." <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's 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 the last thing anybody wants to happen, and it could have been much, much worse. That broken piece, even though it was dull, could have hurt somebody terribly. Um, well, I can tell you that the owner of the dojo was not happy that he poked a floor, uh, poked a hole in his new several hundred dollar, you know, tatami synthetic kind of dojo mat because those are yeah. not inexpensive, um, but. I think of those uh, abusive things as, you know, the vast majority of the time, I'm I'm just breaking a perfectly good sword that's well made and held up. But there are absolutely times where even though it's the minority, it's really shown that, hey, there's a problem here and the vendor needs to address it immediately. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's not valuable until it is. And it, you know, uh, odd as it is, it took me a few years to find a sword or a couple of them that were, that was the case. But I, I can absolutely say there have been a handful of examples where uh, were it not for the the abusive stuff that I was doing, some un, under the hood stuff would not have been surfaced that that absolutely should have been. Yeah. So that, that reminds me of two things I, I forgot to mention. And one was 
what, and this is probably what you meant by um, I may have changed my views, because I think we discussed this on the phone uh, previously, but um, finding out what's inside that blade is impossible unless you break it, because nobody that I know of is doing um, any kind of serious testing on these steels. Um, it's very expensive to get that done. Um, so to have a blade snap and be able to take a look inside and see the grain and see how well it was forged, see where the flaws were, see all that stuff, that's, you're not going to be able to do that without breaking those swords. So I found that very, uh, not just interesting, but very helpful, very uh, insightful. I mean, uh, again, I would never do that. So I'm not going to find out unless somebody else does that. And you were doing that. And I was, uh, it was an advantage for me to know about that. But the other side of the coin, I feel, is that when we're talking about this kind of production sword, you know, whether it's Ronin or whoever it is, just because that sword, let's say the grain was loose and, and not forged right, we all know that these swords, the blades are made by not only different people, but from different factories and one from the other, they're never going to be exactly the same. So if somebody were to have a sword break, a Ronin sword break, and they would announce to the world, never buy a Ronin because this is what their blades are like, you know, that could have been one out of a hundred, that could have been one out of a thousand, it could have been one out of three. I mean, we just don't know that and we would never know that. So in that sense, it didn't really tell me a whole lot about the brand, it told me about that particular sword, that particular blade, but not really about the brand. If that were to happen consistently with a single brand, with, you know, whatever brand it is, that might tell us more, but I really haven't seen you break 20 of the same brand over and over and over and over again. I know you've used some brands more than once. But I, I, I want to say I've published at least six to 10 Ronin Katana Dojo Pro breaking videos. Okay, so that would tell us something about Ronin, but it would also be balanced against how many blades have they sold. So if it's a company that sold... 200 blades then that looks really bad if each one of those had major issues if they've sold two million blades what you know what does that mean compared to the amount sold so you know uh, again i find it very interesting and I, and it's more helpful when it's done with the same brand more than once for sure um, so the, i'm just curious if i can bounce an idea off you right because i i I totally sympathize. I love swords, right? Seeing them broken doesn't... Granted, being the one doing it is like driving a car really fast to the point that the engine explodes, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I get to go that fast, and that part of it is fun. But I, I don't like seeing a beautiful thing destroyed any more than the next guy. Um, yeah, who wanted to destroy all those chargers for um, Dukes of Hazzard? I mean, that's an awful, awful thing that happened. <laughs> I would not want to be that guy. The, uh, precious. <laughs> but but I understand that like as I'm as I'm testing, you know, hypothetically I test a dozen Ronin katanas and I break them and I and I have a, a pretty consistent durability, you know, that they all seem to last about the same. Mm -hmm. That tells you something, but not necessarily as much. And so I, I can understand skepticism there. There there's one example that comes to mind, and it's the LK Chen Song Han Dao. I made a video on it where it broke at the hilt when I hit into a brass fitting. I had to bring it into the point of a review that would be undebatably abusive, right? I had cut branches. I had done things that were, but this is a, a thing that's, you know, emulating a piece from history that's meant to be a battle weapon, right? And so I, I whack a brass fitting in a metal barrel and I, I'm doing that more or less to test the edge and see it's differentially hardened. How well does that edge hold up? Does it chip? And surprisingly, the, the first one that I get, it breaks at the hilt and kind of flies back at me. So I contact the vendor and I, as is the case when something catastrophically fails in the background, I'll tell the vendor, hey, something really bad happened. Here's the video, like a snippet. Here's the things I did before it. Option A, you know, you know, I'm going to make the video. Option B, you can send me a another one and I can include the part A, but also supplement it with maybe it was a fluke, part B was this, right? I got another one. 
So I got another one from LK Chen and it did the exact same thing on the exact same test. I skipped all the other stuff, went to the barrel, hit it in the same place. It broke in the exact same spot, flung back at me the same way, this time more prepared, granted. So we're in a little bit more protective gear. But to, to me, I think back on that breaking as the single, like if I ever broke a sword, that was the, the reason I did it. That one sword showed that this one has a problem. It's It needs to be addressed. I believe they've done it. I still recommend LK Chen products. I think they make really good stuff and I'm confident that they're going to or have addressed that that issue. But um, I think of like all the breaking that I ever did up to that point is like that was the reason it was worth it. I had to abuse it to expose that issue. And that issue was present on two examples consistently in the same way. In my non-scientific methodology, that like encapsulated to me a thing that made all of the other breaking worthwhile. <laughs> So um, your question though was was a the thing that ultimately broke both of them uh what you would consider a non-standard maybe even abusive target or was it like something standard that anybody with that sword would have been cutting what what i saw is it took abuse to break right so i i was hitting a metal a, i have an old water heater barrel that i cut in half and there's a little brass fitting that comes out of it and if I hit that fitting because it's brass and stable, it's a good litmus test for the edge. So bending, chipping, something like that is appropriate on that fitting, but snapping apart at the hilt, obviously not. The The trick is this, uh, this contrast photo that I showed, right? Mm -hmm. Is that 10 years of using that sword to do forms could expose the exact same issue, right? If, if somebody was using and doing, some of those Chinese forms have really abrupt stops where you're, you're thrusting and like holding it out in, in, in your in your form. If you do that, it's entirely possible after a decade that a helicopter of death flies out into the audience because there's a weakness at the hilt, right? It, that was exposed by, by breaking it. But this katana was not weak. It lasted for 10 years. It was a steel sword. It only got you. It was dull. It was in the Aito, but made of steel to have the balance of a, of a sword. And it snapped off at the habaki because it's used by experienced practitioners that are, are creating like a, a really abrupt tense stop where it creates, uh, yeah. you know, some metal fatigue at the hilt. So absolutely, that issue could have been exposed the same way 10 years later. It, it took abuse to get there for me because I don't have 10 years and I don't have a machine. You know, like if you go to an Ikea store and they have like the little... Uh, piston that's sitting in the chair and it's like look this chair can be sat in a hundred thousand times and it's still fine like i don't i don't have a, a thing that does that i have a steel barrel and it absolutely shouldn't have broke there and that tells me that if it were used even for kata or used for cutting that it could have broken or fatigued in such a way that it caused that failure to expose itself many years down the line right and and so that that that's an assumption that i'm making that's you know I'm guessing that's the case because I've seen steel swords break <laughs> in surprising ways after never cutting a single thing and only drawing and sheathing, but being used like, you know, the people will swing them hard and then stop abruptly and that creates some shock in the sword. And uh, right at that hilt is where that's that seems to create metal fatigue. Um, so that that's my assumption is, yeah. I guess, I I would say that I, for me to to come up with my own uh, opinion about those things, I would have to see, especially for that uh, that incident that you showed the picture of. Um, first of all, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind was that it was being used and fatigued for ten years, as you said, and um, it was only the one. I mean, I, I don't know that you know what brand that was or that it's happened to a sword that that same person or brand made in addition to that one incident. So for me, I kind of keep going back to, well, that was one incident and it was under different circumstances. So I can't really form a, a strong opinion about that. And as far as the LK Chen, um, to me, again, I, I would be more interested to, to find out that it broke like that during normal use with normal targets. You know, the fact that you were hitting something that, again, most people that own that sword wouldn't be hitting um, it, you know, and, and it did break in the same way, the same time, you know, again, two times, but 
again, my thinking is if I were to use that sword on normal targets that it was designed for, for, you know, months and months or whatever, would that happen to me? Or would it only happen if I hit a brass fitting on something that was, you know, abusive, or if I was abusing it even prior to that as well? So to me as a consumer, I would want to know those things. I would want to know that there was some kind of more controlled study done on exactly what would break that. And if those things that broke it would be things that people would typically do with those swords. Because again, if I'm never going to cut anything more than a single roll mat or some water jugs, I don't know that I would be as concerned with that happening the way it did. You know, so again, I, I would... I think like uh, more controlled scientific kind of thinking, I would want to know that these things are, are given lots and lots and lots of testing, like you mentioned with those automatic test things and, and things like that, where something simulating somebody's ass sits on a seat a thousand times in a row. Am I going to be sitting on that seat? Yes. Am I about that way? Probably. So that would make more sense than if they were to, you know, start firing into a seat with a 12 gauge and saying, well, this thing doesn't hold up. You know, <laughs> I could be doing that. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, so I don't know that I'd be so concerned. But there's another thing that uh, while you were uh, describing um, and maybe making a comparison to Battlefield, a lot of people don't really understand exactly what these swords were capable of, um, what they were designed for, what they were used for. So uh, in a Battlefield situation where you'd be thinking about striking somebody that's wearing armor, possibly metal, something really tough, probably. Um, did that happen as often as they think it did? I don't think it did. I think most of the time when you're talking battlefield and armor, you're talking about pole arms, you're talking about um, uh, missile weapons, you're talking about things like that. I think the actual sword was maybe the last resort if all else failed and you had nothing left on you to fight with, you may draw your sword. But even if you did and you were to strike somebody wearing metal armor or tough armor, to expect that the sword was never damaged in those situations is also not accurate, in my opinion, and from the research that I've done. These swords that were made by sometimes master smiths with the best technology they had at the time they had their limits. I mean, these swords broke and were damaged all the time. They would chip, they would break, they would bend, they would take sets, they would torque. I mean, we've seen it in a couple of videos where people, uh, Japanese made swords used by Japanese uh, practitioners, some of them very, very experienced, would take a really nasty set um, on a, a cut of a, of a mat or, or even snap and break off. These swords, while they're really amazing, the technology and they're designed to do specific things, they took damage and they still take damage. Um, there's there's steels now that we use that are much more durable. Um, there's some steels that people say are indestructible as far as, you know, uh, even standard stuff and even abusive stuff. Um, but this wasn't the case then. It just was not the case. Um, Swords would get, again, broken, damaged. They'd become useless. Pieces would jiggle and rattle all the time. They'd have to get new handles made. They'd have to get it rewrapped because the wrapping would get loose or come off or break. I mean, these are just things that happened. And uh, people spent a fortune back then on repairing their swords and buying new swords when they had to. Um, so nothing was, you know, run into a battlefield and chop down 10 people in armor and, hey, that sword was able to do it. Why is this sword snapping, you know, when I hit one thing that's uh, abusive? You know, so I think a lot of people just don't realize what the sword is. It's gotten this reputation for, be you know, you know all the cliches about cutting, you know, tank barrels and gun barrels and mountains in half and all this, uh, you know. I've tried, <laughs> I've tried doing it myself a few times. <laughs> far from the truth. Uh, so to, to learn that stuff and to have realistic expectations is really important, I think, when you're buying something like this and to buy the best thing you can for the use that it's going to receive, um, whether it's going to be a display piece, you'd want to buy it for those specific reasons. If it's going to be a 
dojo cutter you'd want to buy for those if you want to do some crazy backyard stuff cutting fruit and fun things and maybe even some branches and things that are abusive then you know you focus on that you look for that in your sword but it's certainly not universal it's certainly not oh katana is the toughest piece of sharp steel that's ever been created because it certainly isn't it's vulnerable just like any other thing you know well, that's one thing I guess I have shown is that they can't break. <laughs> um, yeah, that that's where we can find common ground. Well, we're. Uh, uh, I, I appreciate your thoughts on on that, Josh. I, I appreciate the devil's advocate to it. Uh, I, I do uh, also want to. We bet we've been at it for about a, an hour and a half now. I, I want to move toward a close here and maybe just give you a, a chance to talk about anything that maybe you think folks should know about swords or about you or anywhere you want to steer the conversation. I, uh, we're, we're winding down a little bit, so I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, great. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have much to say about me that I didn't already announce, uh, in case some people haven't seen, I am really not taking commissions now, but I am open to taking one or two here and there. I'm never going to, uh, build up a queue like I did. There's no wait lists. You can't ask me to put your name on any kind of list. I'm not going to do it. When a spot opens up, I'll let people know. And um, I will take former customers as priority over new customers. Um, I feel like there's that loyalty there. And I want to, you know, make them happy like I did before. Um, I only work with people that I enjoy working with. Certainly, uh, if it's going to be, again, I would only want to work with people that I really enjoy working with. So when those spots do open up, it's probably going to go to those people first. Um, but, you know, to say I'm never going to do another commission is not true. I, I really do see that in the future somewhere. I want to spend some time getting my own stuff out there. I enjoy it. I, I Not that, you know, doing the commissions really felt like uh, a drag like uh, working in the coal mines um, because I still was working on things that I enjoy but working on my own stuff gives me a different kind of feeling it gives me a freedom it gives me joy um, so I, I want to do a couple of those I have one that's in process now as, as long as my body is willing um, I want to get that one done and I have some other ideas I want to maybe put out a couple of suba maybe make a couple of sets of sepa you know try my hand at different things. Um, I still am going to be working with uh, Dave and Fei Long Swords. We have some ideas for uh, future models. And um, so look out for, for those things coming up. And, you know, it, it is a very small batch kind of thing. So there's a long time in between. And I know that uh, it could be tough to wait for the new ones to come out, but, we have no plans right now of stopping as long as the market allows, you know, costs going up, things getting tougher, um, competing with uh, more new brands on the market. Uh, we never really wanted to compete. We wanted to be our own thing. Um, but people that are looking to buy, they're going to compare us. And uh, I just want to let people know that we're still liking what we're doing and we still want to keep doing it as long as everything uh, that in, that's involved allows us to keep doing that. Um, I also, uh, we didn't talk about it, but I uh, like working on other things that aren't exactly swords or, or katana, at least. I've wrapped more than a few lightsaber hilts, which I really enjoy. My uh, good friend, Todd Johnson um, of Darth Alice Sabres, he's an incredibly talented um, craftsman, uh, he, he turns these things by hand on a lathe and using CNC, and now he's using lasers to do these incredible designs. His wife has gotten really good at uh, doing the Cerakote, I think it's called, and powder coating and uh, coloring these, these hilts, and it's just a blast working on because I love Star Wars, and uh, it's very similar to uh, working on, you know, katana handles. Um, so I'm going to do more of those in the future for him, with him. Um, you know, I'm just going to keep doing this kind of thing as long as I can. I don't see me stopping for any other reason other than I just 
physically can't do it anymore. I hope that doesn't happen. But, uh, you know, I'm chugging along and doing what I can do. And it's going to be uh, slow, <laughs> as it usually is. But, um, you know, I'm still... What in. projects are you most interested in? So, it's, uh, you know, it sounds like if I'm, if I'm paraphrasing, I get the... You know, like I, I don't want to put myself in a three year long wait list again. It creates an immense amount of stress. I can I can sympathize, as can many of the people that shoulder a burden at work. Um, what, what kind of stuff really engages you, though? What what do you want to work on? If somebody said I have a this, what would what would that be that really <laughs> compelled you to want to want to do the project? First off, it would be the brand. You know, I have to say that it would be the quality of the piece. Um, I, I am more excited to work on something that, again, I know I could produce my best work on. I'm not interested in, in working on anything that I feel is going to limit me. The more I grow in my art and skill and craft, the more I want to be able to, to make that uh, happen in the maximum way. So I'm really not going to take anything else uh, from uh, some of the brands that I mentioned, uh, that kind of level of stuff, because it's not fair for me. It's not fair for the customer. They're just not going to get my best work. Um, there's other people that are coming up and learning to do this kind of thing, and they might be more willing to to work with those those brands. I feel for the people that want those brands customized, but uh, I'm just not the person to do that anymore. So I'm thinking brand is going to be, you know, branding quality is going to be number one. Two, I like working with people that um, have the same kind of creative sense that I do. They don't have to like everything that I like. Um, but I like when we jive and it, it flows and it doesn't seem like a task. It seems like a project that I can get behind. Um, so there's going to be, I'm going to be more discriminating in that sense. So no, um, my little pony katana. Is that what I'm hearing? Unless it was something, I, I'm not, I'm not that traditional of a guy, you know, <laughs> my, some of my first stuff was really out there. I was using ostrich leg skin and all kinds of crazy things. I was buying pendants for Manuki and, you know, so I, I'm open to a lot of stuff. Uh, I, I would say that I can't really count out my little pony altogether without knowing the rest of the project, you know, but okay. it's got to excite me and I got to feel like I'm going to be able to do my best work if I'm going to take on something like that. Got me excited and at least five other people about the My Little Pony Katana. And the one other big thing I want to do with my time is I've been meaning to do this for so long is be more involved with um, my Katana Craft group on Facebook and be more involved with making and providing more tutorials. I have tutorials that are severely out of date and are really just for the very beginners. Um, I want to make something a little more advanced for the people that are dedicated to learning this uh, because I know how hard it was for me to find any information when I first started. Still really hard to find quality information out there. Uh, so I want to do a lot more of that. Um, so I'm, I'm more active in the Katana Gra Craft Group. I've invited anybody to email me at any time with uh, questions about a sword they're considering to give my opinion, to give suggestions, advice, that kind of thing. I'll never, you know, not answer those emails. Uh, so I just want to be involved with the sword community more. I want to be involved with the craft and people wanting to learn the craft. Um, I don't hold any secrets back. You know, I'm really open with everything I've learned to do. And if somebody wants to dedicate that time and effort into learning how to do that, I get behind them a thousand percent. I get excited when I see improvement um, when, when people are, are learning, I mean, it's like the greatest thing to see from the first handle they did to the second, to the third, and that they're improving and getting into it and feeling proud of it and enjoying it. I'm all about that. I, I love it. Uh, I really do. So expect to see me online in those places more and expect to see more tutorials. And uh, I, I expect to blog more about uh, things like we're talking about now. Uh, just to get it out there, you know, I expect to see more of that. Well, I I think that's a positive note to end on. So I, I uh, I'm I'm glad to hear you're going to be out there in the in the blogs and that people can email you. Uh, hopefully, the Cottontail Customs website is the, a good place to to find your contact info and to do that. If it's not, then let me know and I'll update the description to include. Yeah, it will be. Um, I temporarily took out my contact 
information or even the form um, because I wasn't taking commissions, but I'm going to put that back up and I'm going to, you know, specify what it's for and, and who should use it and stuff like that. So it will be there. And, and yes, I did use the right, you know, link to the website and all that. I plan on keeping that website up as long as I possibly can. Well, good deal. Um, then I, I think that's a, that's a good spot to, to close it down. Uh, Josh, stick around for a minute after, after I close the video, we'll, we'll, uh, chat for just a second, but I do want to offer a special thanks to you for being open to talking to some five headed weirdo on the internet about swords. I, <laughs> it's kind of spur of the moment, technical difficulties. We work through it and I appreciate your patience and you. your time. Thank you, Matthew. This has been uh, more enjoyable than I even was hoping it was going to be. Honestly, it's been a blast and I would be happy to do it again. So thank you very much. I'll take you up on that. All right. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Th I'm sorry as well as, as this tradition for me, I suck at chat. I highlighted a few comments, but there's there's been, I think, 30 or so people that have cycled through the live and uh, chat has been has been going though I am I am not good at it. I appreciate everyone for tuning in. Hopefully it's been interesting and uh, cheers. Have a good night.